It doesn't take long on the FMS website to realize we've got a lot of courses that you can consume and, and elevate your knowledge about functional movement. Specifically, young clinicians, uh, ATCs dealing in sports medicine, chiropractors, physical therapists, uh, come to us and looking at all the functional movement type courses we have, the SFMA, more of a clinical application, the FMS, more of a functional application, FCS, more of a fitness application. They want to know where to start, and since we don't know where you work or who you are, it's really hard to make those specific recommendations. But let me take you back uh, a long, long time ago when I was a guest lecturer in numerous physical therapy programs. I actually would start by teaching the FMS. I had a class full of students. Some had a big uh, advantage with anatomy and biomechanics. Some had barely brushed by those subjects. You don't need those subjects. You don't need kinesiology, exercise phys, anatomy, or biomechanics to take the functional movement screen workshop. It's simply movement patterns and how you're scoring that. You don't need to know the heart anatomy to take blood pressure either, and you don't need to be able to dissect an eye to do an eye chart. So I would use the functional movement screen as a system with which to almost inject a little humility into a young physical therapy or chiropractic class. Here's how I would do it. Before they had a lot of the heavy course work that we take in orthopedics and neurology, I would teach them the movement screen, and that's about a half day job. Uh, then I would have them movement screen each other. Well, sure enough, we had 10 or 20% of the people in that class that had pain on the movement screen. Well, they go over there, their clinical problems. We had another few people in the class that were almost perfect in the movement screen. They go over there, obviously, we didn't catch them. We got the center of the class with movement problems. No pain, and they're not perfect. And I said, listen guys, why don't I leave the room, go get a coffee, and uh, somebody fix her push-up, somebody fix his squat, that guy has unbelievably asymmetrical shoulder mobility and this person can't lunge. Attack that. I'm gonna go get a cup of coffee, I'll be back. I would come back to a room full of blank stares, they wouldn't know what to do. And then I would get to drop the bomb on them that I'd set up the whole time. How do you expect me to teach you to change movement in the presence of pain, once you're a therapist or a chiropractor, when you're scared to death to change movement even when the person isn't complicated by symptoms or pain? If you don't feel comfortable trying to improve somebody's squat without making something else worse or hurting them in some way, then we've got a bigger problem than just making somebody's pain go away. We're here to restore function, we're here to look at movement, and looking at that in a format that's uncomplicated by pain is actually a healthy perspective because it shows you where you're effective and where you're not. I don't get that opportunity with a lot of people, so we have a lot of young clinicians take the SFMA, they may have never heard of the functional movement screen or think it doesn't apply to them. The SFMA is going to basically show you how to break down and categorize movement that is complicated by pain and uncomplicated by pain that is measured both functionally and dysfunctionally. And so when people come to an SFMA level one workshop, the same back pain that you saw on Tuesday, you go back the following week and now you see the exact same back pain, but you got two other pieces of information. Now, with the SFMA, you found dorsiflexion problem on the uh, left and a single leg stance balance problem on the right. Now, these may or may not be causing low back pain, and it's not here to say one is causing it and one is not, but I want you to embrace regional interdependence the way distant body parts can affect a, a problem somewhere else. And then also say, listen, changing somebody's dorsiflexion, not normalizing, but just changing it in an appreciable way, five, 10 degrees, is within all people's skill set. Whether you use static stretching or mobs or a manipulation or, or an advanced technique, it doesn't matter. But you can change dorsiflexion probably less than 10 minutes in an appreciable way. Now, we can also change single leg stance on right in just a few seconds. You can isolate it and really try to coach somebody into better balance strategy, or you can actually just squeeze their environment, find a balance beam, and have them walk back and forth on the balance beam. I'll go into a little bit more of that later, but at the point that I'm trying to make is change the dorsiflexion, change the balance, revisit the low back pain, revisit the SFMA distribution of patterns. Did things change? If they did, then dorsiflexion and or single leg stance is probably a much bigger influence in their low back pain than you once thought. 
If you prove that this has no effect, you've learned something. If you've proved that it cured the low back pain, you've learned something. So the same low back pain that people see before their SFMA course, they still see that low back pain. And now they see these dysfunctional, non-painful patterns that could easily be major, minor contributors to the problem. And if they're not a contributor to the problem, good for you for ruling it out. Now, they get a lot of excitement and they want more SFMA. And we have SFMA level two. We're gonna go deep into some of those things that you're having difficulty with. Some of the problems you're having a hard time solving, some of the solutions that you're trying to get to a little bit quicker. Well, we find that a lot of people come to this and don't really know where their problems are because they don't have enough reps simply doing the tool, the SFMA to break down movement. So one of the things that I think really helps out is while you're waiting for say an SFMA2 opportunity to come close to you or have the convenience or travel time to take that opportunity, the FMS is a great perspective and here's why. A young clinician or a clinician new to the SFMA is going to find things they're very successful with. When the SFMA exposes T-spine mobility, about 70 to 80% of the time, you have pretty good success with that. 25 to 20% of the time you don't. That's acceptable because there are complicating issues. Some T-spines have really bad shoulders and necks and lumbar spines attached to them. And so they're more complicated. But if you're success rate is between 70, 75, 80% with a given thing you find, you seem to have the methodology, the skill set, the manual skills, the resets to change that. And then you're gonna start finding, you know, when, when I see uh, hip medial rotation, or when I see that last bit of shoulder internal rotation, I have a lot of difficulty with that. Well, you're not gonna know that if you don't have a baseline. Here's what I'm saying. Use the SFMA on intake, but what do we say to do on exit? Well, you can do a modified movement screen, you can do a full movement screen, and you can even incorporate some of the motor control screens that we've introduced. This is important for anybody going back to an active occupation, an active lifestyle with lots of hobbies or outdoor activities, a fitness lifestyle or athletics. So almost everybody who comes through a outpatient orthopedic clinic going back to some level of activity deserves some kind of screen on exit that is different than the screen that they had on intake. It's important for them and it's important for you. And that feedback loop tells you what you're successful with and what you're not successful with. So the best way to check your outcomes is not to repeat the SFMA and just prove that you took care of pain. That's job one, but once they're out of pain, how do you know how much function they have? How can you make a prognosis and how can you make a recommendation of what exercises would help support their active lifestyle, their fitness, their sport, their occupation? You can't make that decision based on the SFMA. There's more loads and more complex patterns here, more like real life. These obstacles, the, the FMS is simply an obstacle course that sees if you're going to run into failure anytime life squeezes you into an asymmetrical stance, a reciprocal pattern, pelvic dissociation, one leg up, one leg down. So I think it's probably a, a prudent and logical step to do SFMA1 understand a new way of looking at movement, and then when you do decide to work on that leg, work on that back, work on that T-spine, you get them out of pain, it's a great, great case, they've done well, check your work. Because what you're gonna see is that function isn't perfect, but you're gonna learn what you're changing and what you're not changing, and then how to make those layers of recommendations. Should you go to this trainer that also knows the SM FMS, or should you basically follow these exercises, cycle back around with us in about six weeks? You can play this any way you want. Once you've done this and you know where you're successful discharging people with really good percentages of function and where you're unsuccessful, now you go to SFMA2 and ask one of our experts to help you work through a problem that you didn't know you had had you not bounced your SFMA clinical skills off of a functional platform. The best way to prepare for SFMA2 is to know both the intake exam 
and the exit exam and knowing where you're really effective and where you're not. And then one of our expert instructors at SFMA2 will run the scenarios that present difficulty. One of the things you may find out is you just need a manual therapy course. You just need to investigate probably functional exercise a little bit deeper. You need, if you want to make some fitness recommendations, some correctives at this level, well, that is what FMS2 does. We're going to basically amplify this for those people in a really robust lifestyle to maintain function while they're pursuing different fitness goals. When their occupational stress goes up, imagine firefighters, police officers, military, they're going to have different things. We can find out how to fix these problems here. So these are solutions. These are solutions. What we find is a lot of people don't even have a good distribution of where their successes are and where their issues and problems are. And these two things will really, really help you see your population and your influence on your population. For more information, visit functionalmovement.com.